It's about pride. It's about legacy. I want to make history in boxing. That's why I'm here. When you want to win something this big, you got to risk it all. But I'm ready, and I prepare myself for a different kind of fight. My whole career has been about chasing Canelo. Undisputed versus Undisputed. This weekend, one of the biggest fights of the year is going down on Showtime. The legendary Canelo Alvarez versus my Texas brother, Jamel Charlo. For the big fight, we're partnering with DraftKings, giving all new customers a can't-miss offer. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings app now. Use promo code SMOKE when you sign up. Stack, what's your prediction for the big fight? My heart's saying Charlo, but I know how experienced Canelo is. He's the face of boxing, and he's been in big fights before. Uh, I think it's going to go to a decision, and I think Canelo might pull it off. New customers, you heard Stack. Download the DraftKings app now. Use promo code SMOKE and make your picks. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers, use promo code SMOKE. Bet $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code SMOKE only at DraftKings. The crown is yours. Welcome back to All The Smoke. We're here at the beautiful Wynn Hotel at the Excess mm. Nightclub. Um, and we got a really good guest. I've been chasing this guy down for a long time, but it's rare in this business, in this game, to meet real, genuine, good people. Solid. And this dude that we have here today is, is at the head of the class when it comes to that. Welcome to the show, Rich Clemens. My man. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Thank being you for here. coming. Co-founder of uh, Boardroom, 35 Ventures, serial entrepreneur, uh, just a really head smart business monster. We got to do something together, bro. We sure something, do. Something. Something. How's life right now? Obviously, out here for Summer League, you guys are doing boardroom stuff. You guys have a party tonight. Yeah. Um, what's going on? Life is good, man. I'm enjoying what I do, which I think is like the biggest blessing for all of us. Um, I got an event out here tonight celebrating the WNBA boardroom, Coinbase, hosting it with Jewel Lloyd, Sabrina Inescu. Um, and Sue Bird. And, you know, for me, it's just about extending the brand. Kevin and I started together and helping formulate what his business was going to be and starting to set the foundation for the rest of his life. And that meant building him a family office. And that's what 35 Ventures was. But as we were building it, there was this void for a storytelling vehicle to tell the world what we were doing, but also something that embodied the two of us and our partnership and the uniqueness of it. And that's kind of what Boardroom was from the beginning. Absolutely. We're going to get to boardroom in a little bit. Thoughts on the New Look Suns? Uh, you were able to acquire Bradley Beal, him, KD, Book, uh, building a supporting cast still. But, you know, what are the, uh, 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 what's the vibe over there? What's it looking like? Yeah. I mean, well, I didn't acquire Bradley Beal, but. Uh... <laughs> KD did. So you're a part of KD. Right? Um, <laughs> but I'm happy for him, man. I mean, I think that's been our journey the last um, 10 years is, you know, I haven't repped other players. So our business and our life and everything was very much a mesh with one another. And the one thing that I always clearly deferred to was his vision with basketball. And the same thing happened in the Hamptons when we were sitting there choosing the team to leave Thunder to go mm -hmm. play for the Warriors. And as he looked at New York and looked at other options, it's always been about like me understanding his point of view and supporting it and then going and helping him execute it. And he's happy. And if he's happy, you know, it's infectious. When he's happy, everyone in our organization's happy. And um, I just, you know, you guys, I'm sure, feel the same way. I just want Kevin to win. Yeah, I want right. him to be successful. Yeah. And, and I think he's in a really good place right now. Love it. When did the wheels start to turn when you started um, 35 Ventures? And uh, what was the goals for KD early on? Two questions. I guess, well, the wheels for me probably started turning from the time I was like a kid in New York. I've been obsessed with sports culture, hip hop culture. I grew up in New York in the 80s and 90s. So I watched it explode and I, I was a fan, I observed it. And 
you know, I took many steps to get there, but by the time I was able to meet Kevin and I was at a point in my career at Rock Nation where I had such great information from watching Jay, from watching the way they built their business. And even from before I got to Jay, being an entrepreneur at 19, 20, 22, just hustling. All of those experiences put me in a position where, in my opinion, I became the perfect partner for Kevin. And what that meant was he was at a place in his career where he was like, I want to do less and I want to accomplish more. I have mm -hmm. commercials on where I'm 12 feet tall and that's not who I am. You know what I'm saying? And I think a lot of young athletes find themselves sometimes in the beginning of their career doing things that are just part of the system. But Kevin all of a sudden looked at me and was like, what more can we do? And I came from hip hop where like, you're always making something out of nothing. You know, if you're an artist building your brand, you're doing it from day one with no fans. You have to put out a mixtape. Mm -hmm. You have to get your neighborhood behind you. So I understood how to like, turn down money to make money later on or to build community and fan base and build brand. And it'll ultimately come with money down the road. And Kevin was down with that because he wanted to build and he marveled at the Jay-Z's of the world and the Dr. Dre's as well. That imprint that, you know, hip hop had formed. And obviously LeBron had started to put like the most like meticulous setup in front of him. And all of that was really inspiring for mm -hmm. us. How did you and Kevin meet because obviously being professional athletes, there are always a bunch of people in the business world, but it's hard to kind of find the right fit. And once you guys locked in, you guys have been hand in hand ever since. So how did that relationship start? I met him, crazy story was I met, I was managing Wale. Like I used to be a music manager. Wale, Meek Mill, Solange, No ID. I had a handful of artists at the time and Wale's from um, DC, Maryland, Virginia mm -hmm. area, same as um, KD. And Jay-Z had a show at the Garden. He was like, Katie's in town and wants to go to the Jay show. You should meet up with him. I'm a Hoop fan. So even though Katie's 10 years younger than me, like this is the Rookie of the Year. He was in town to get the Rookie of the Year trophy. So I met him, took him to the show. And I've said this before, but one of the things I marveled at, and I'm sure you guys can relate this knowing KD the way you do, is I think Jay or his manager had said, yo, bring K back to the dressing room after the show. And he was like, "I'm yo, I'm not even ready to meet Jay yet. Like, I have more to do. And like, right. what 18-year-old will even right. have that thought right. process, right? right? He was just like, it's not time. And we stayed in touch. Like, we talked ball. And again, like, looking back on it, obviously, that's what Kevin loves to do. So me having that outlet to just build a relationship with him talking basketball, by the time it came to us at Rock Nation looking to get in the sports world, and Kevin at a point in his career where he was looking at something different, it was timing. And I think every great partnership, and I've really explored this. Like I've talked to Jimmy and Dre about this and really tried to dissect like what makes a partnership, partnership. works. Like why are the two of you so perfect together, right? It's like something that you have that you don't have as well, Jack makes up for, mm -hmm. you know exactly. what I'm saying? And there's something that balances KD and I out that allows us to succeed on this level. And then mm -hmm. rooted is just this like inherent trust that we have mm -hmm. for one another. That's the most important. Um, describe the journey for you guys. Like you said, you've been there since the beginning. There's been a, a lot of ups. There's been downs. Uh, there's been media situations. There's been championships. How do you guys, or how, how do you kind of keep it even keeled? And, and, and how much does he lean on you when things are going, whether good or bad? Yeah, I mean, I think we lean on each other, but at the same time, we also have such great perspective. No matter how crazy certain things have appeared or the narrative has appeared throughout the last decade, the joke was always we were at home kind of laughing at it. Even when it was like, shit, I wish this didn't happen, right? right? Or I didn't know it was going to happen like this. It was still with a little bit of an understanding of how blessed he was to be in the situation. And Kevin really does have that mindset. And there were times where like, it was insane, especially as social media was growing and it was new. It was almost new yep. to see some of these reactions. Mm -hmm. And I think we've talked about this, like even after he left Oklahoma to, to the Bay, I mean, I think we all knew that there would be pushback. We all knew that the fans would be emotional, mm -hmm. but I think that was like an inflection point in sports media as well, where it went like really dark. It went really visceral, where like after that happened, people were like coming for his head. And he could have reacted like with his fists up or he could have reacted like, I'm just gonna go hoop. Oh, right. And Very he simple. just was like, let me just go hoop. And I know if I continue to put the work in, these things will be distracted. Mm -hmm. 
won't be a distraction right. and we'll keep it moving. And that's, that's kind of how we've approached all of it. That's the great escape for him. That that two and a half hours to get out and, and be one of the greatest to ever do it is always a great escape. Uh, the Hampton Five, we've had a chance to talk to Draymond, Steph, and Clay, how that went down. Uh, what is your version of it? Well, first of all, it, looking back on it, it was like w such a spectacle. Like it was so over the top to have like a house <laughs> in East Hampton and having like Pat Riley and Greg Popovich and Steph and Tom Brady flying in. But then the flip side is it's like makes for an incredible moment and an incredible story in our careers. The backstory though is I was going through some shit in my own family life. And to show you how selfless Kevin is, this was his moment. And I was like, bro, I have to be in New York. Like I have to be close to New York. Some shit's going on with my family. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, then we're doing it near your family. And that was it. That's and next happened. thing I knew, I went out to find the, the best scenario for getting him some kind of peace of mind, but also so he understood that if I wasn't close enough and had that balance to take care of what I needed to, that I wouldn't have been locked in. Yeah. And it really was like 10 hours a day at the house in the Hamptons going through these just like insane meetings for like a young hoop fan growing up to be sitting across from Pat Riley was wild. But then going home and dealing with something and that's who KD is, right. you know what I'm saying? That's the side of him he won't talk about or the side of him that like he doesn't have to talk about. But you know, that moment right then when he had every right to make it all about himself, he was just like, yo, bro, where you need to do this? Family, yeah, right. Give us some shit. Was there anyone else he really considered when he was leaving OKC? Was it Golden State the whole time? I mean, you mentioned Pat Riley, that's obviously the heat. Any teams that he really gave a, hey, this can possibly work as well? Well, I'll give you a funny story that I actually just talked about um, with Tom Brady at Ruben's party. That's just like a super flex, mm -hmm. right? Um, <laughs> but I remember when the Celtics came, like, so the Warriors came with Steph, Draymond, Andre, Bob, um, Joe Lacob. I mean, they brought everybody. Mm -hmm. And then the Celtics came and had a younger team at the time. So it was the Celtics ownership and Danny Ainge and then like Jay Crowder and I think Kelly Olynyk was there. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like already it was like, okay, the Celtics is a different sell right? But here came Tom Brady. So it was like, all right, shit, they really trying to <laughs> right. level the playing field. So they went to take a walk together, I think. Brady or, and KD? Yeah. And then later on, KD was like, yeah, yo. So he told me I should, bottom line, look for the best team, best organization, best chance to win no matter what. And I was just like, pause for a second. He's like, I think Brady just told me to go to the Warriors. Bro. <laughs> 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 so like that whole trip was about understanding what was out there. It was an incredible experience to listen to these guys speak. And honestly, like, they were there for Kevin, but for me, I was like, damn, this guy's giving me the seat. You know what I'm saying? This was like a, a wind at my sail. I was like, wow, like I'm gonna talk to Pat Riley the way I envisioned talking to Pat Riley when I was a kid. This is incredible. Right. And I felt like we all stepped up. And I think Kevin ultimately like truly listened to everybody. He was open-minded. It was so painful for him to leave Oklahoma City, yep. so painful. We documented the whole thing. Not that I let it out, but like there's moments where you could see this was not easy. some easy mm -hmm. thing for yeah. KD. Like, yo, where's the 73 win team? Like this shit was about him really going inside his mind and he relies on the game and he made the decision based on basketball and it all happened there. And I, there was never really anyone else because once he went through all of that, it was clear. Clear. Mm -hmm. Talk about your upbringing, growing up in the Big Apple. Grew up in New York. Back in like the 80s and 90s, there was like a middle class in New York. So I really had an understanding of like all walks of life and I really prided myself on that. And the one thing that I took advantage of was a network, always. Didn't, didn't do well in school, wasn't focused ever. Family life, complete chaos. And the way I was able to like fill that void was having as many people around me as possible. All, and it didn't matter. It wasn't about the most popular dude in the park or the prettiest group of girls. It was just, I want to have as many people and support around me. Because I knew that if I didn't have a real currency in education, I didn't have anyone that was going to direct me somewhere, that at the very least, this group of people around me, we would all support each other. And I always felt that way. And as I got older in New York, at different points in my life, I was always able to pull from that. So. Mm -hmm. Even if it was like going up to Riverside Church where I had no business playing as a kid, but I was like, but Kareem Reed's up there. The Young Hoopers are up there. I have to be up there. I have to just be around 
and watch. And even if no one even knew I was in the gym, I was just watching and observing it all. And I got to know so many people that, you know, by the time I started my journey, it was unconventional, but I had like an army of people that I felt would be there in my corner. And it wasn't like famous people, it was just people Good that people. would ride for me. Mm -hmm. That's the side of support yeah. system. Back to, uh, I tell people all the time, the church is the best AAU team of all time. You have Ron Artest, you have Eric Barkley, you have Lamar Odom, you have Reggie Jesse, you have Elton Brand, you have Speedy Claxon, uh, Kevin Morris. This is the church. Mm -hmm. This is all on one team in one summer. Man, Kevin Morris, he was nice. Bro, this is all on one team in one summer, though, bro. They were, cold. they were scary, dog. How yeah. old are you? What's that? How old are you? 46. Oh, so yes, you're in Same our age, age range. Yeah. 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 You, that's, you, you, that's why I did point guards, though, because those, yeah. those were my idols. Like, yeah. I idolized all those guys growing mm -hmm. up. Yep, yeah, all my guys. So you, we all know you was born hustler. I mean, selling all kind of stuff from wrestling uh, figures. Was that just natural? I heard like, I heard people fight about money all the time. <laughs> it's like people fought about money. So it made me realize that like shit, if you don't have it or if someone doesn't have it or if like they're always fighting about money, if this is all my parents is talking about, then it just like clicked in me that I had to figure that out in some way. And then on top of it, there was like three people I idolized. Basketball players, uh, anyone from the world of hip hop, and anyone that had a business, anyone. So the guy with the hot dog stand, the bodega guy, yeah. I just thought it was incredible that they mm -hmm. got up every day, take out that knot. Like the hot dog stand knot used to get, I, my mind was blown. I'd be mm -hmm. like, he worked here all day and it was just singles. But that feeling of like, fulfillment, I saw that and I didn't get it in school. I didn't really feel it anywhere else. So I saw these people and I'm like, damn, these people get up every day and the energy in New York, right? You grow up in New York City. If you go by like the business district or where people are going to work, you just see like hundreds of people piling off the train. And that just felt like the action to me. So as soon as I thought of a way to make money, if I was like, oh, someone just got me these new wrestling figures, those joints that everyone had with the thumb, yeah. I'm like, everyone in my school wants them. So my thought instantly was like, how much can I sell these for to everyone in my school? And that's just the way my brain worked, for better or worse. And, you know, it's why I got into gambling and like booking at such a young age, because without an education and without any direction, it was, I wasn't, built to hustle. I wasn't going to sell drugs. It wasn't my environment. But what I saw when I started to get out there was like, I can be entrepreneurial. I just gravitated towards like the wrong, or, wrong things earlier, but I quickly shifted that. So programs outside the garden, um, New York's big time New York sports fan. Who are some of the guys that you love watching growing up? Anyone that knows me knows I was obsessed with Mark Jackson as a kid, man. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite player, and he's become one of my favorite people because 1987, he was drafted as a rookie, won rookie of the year, took the city over. 1988, made the All-Star game, they drafted Strick, so it started getting like a bit controversial. And then all of a sudden, he had a few tough years in New York, and it was right during like a really tough time in my life. And I don't know, everyone finds something to like connect oh, to. Yeah. And somehow that became my like reprieve. I would just like, let me go watch Mark. I would sneak out of my house and watch him play in Clipper games and sports bars at 13 and take that money from selling toys and say to the guy, let me go watch the Clipper game. And they would get it on pay, like pay-per-view there was or whatever, satellite back then. And then obviously Starks and Oakley and Ewing, that whole team, that whole period of my life. Um, it was always about that mob, even now. And, and Nick fans from that era are like, we're so emotionally confused because we swear that that was like one of the greatest runs in basketball history. But then you step out of New York and people are like, yo, <laughs> y'all talk about the 90s Knicks like you won three chips. Like, we get it. We've all been to the conference finals. But you guys know, you, you were around then. Like, it was just that whole feeling around those Pacer Knicks series, the Heat Knicks mm -hmm. series, Bulls Knicks series, all of it was incredible. In your early 20s, you was a college dropout. Uh, I tell people all the time, college don't, def don't necessarily make you be successful. It gotta help you, but it don't hurt you too if you don't go. But you had the illegal uh, sports gambling ring. I would have loved to have been a part of that for a minute. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to hear about that. When I saw that in the rundown, I'm like, what? A hundred clients. Uh, can you talk about that? Yes, I love talking about that. I like that. shit like um, that. <laughs> well, I probably shouldn't have went to college, by the way. I wasn't even ready to go. So like, I just ran off to the only school that let me in <laughs> straight up. And when I got there, I tried for a quick minute. I was like, maybe this is like my life. Like. I'm going to figure this out. 
And then I went to watch uh, Yankee, Yankees Mariners, 1995. And I'm sitting in this bar in Boston with a bunch of guys, and everybody's taking the Yankees, but they're all looking for a bookie to put the bet in with. Because, like, you know, if you're all from New York, you always bet on, on your team. The Mariners had, like, A-Rod and Junior and Tino Martinez. That was tough. So everyone was like, yo, we need a bookie. We need a bookie. Someone's got to put a bet in. Like, we got to get this, we got to get these bets in. So I was like, well, hold up. I think I have a bookie. I called my brother and I was like, yo, that bookie you have in Atlanta, you got to put all these bets I'm taking in from this guy. He was like, man, that bookie cut me off, <laughs> right? So I'm like, we don't have a bookie? The game was starting in a few minutes. So my brother hit me with the like, you could always take the bet. I'm like, what does that mean? I didn't even really know like the verbiage. He was like, Mariners are like minus 110 or whatever it is. Like, you'll win this if the Mariners win. And I'm like, all right. So I went in there. I said, guys, I put all your bets in. I, write it, I wrote it down on like a notebook from the, um, from the bar. Mariners won. They all paid me on Friday. That was, this was like a Thursday. And Sunday morning, phone's ringing. I was open. They thought I was a bookie. <laughs> and from that point forward, I was just like, shit. I went and got one of those like composition notebooks because there was no technology. I had my pencil out, number two pencil at like eight in the morning. I had this girl I was dating that would help me when the phones rang. Security at Boston would help me sometimes pick up money. And then like a few other friends at other schools started sending clients in. And at one point I had, you know, like a hundred different people betting. All day. And people would come to me and be like, man, I, I got no more money. Here's my television. It was it was insane, right? Yeah, I was just like right. that guy so at how college. how old were you at that time? You 19, 20 years 18, old? 18, 19, 20. Damn. And then I went back to New York when I was... I, I had to leave Boston. I went to, I tried to flip it and go to BC night school for a semester and was like, found myself trying to get the marketing professor to bet with me. I'm like, <laughs> even I knew, like the one thing I always had was a level of self-awareness, even when I was fucked up. I was like, I'm fucked up. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to be a bookie. So when I went back to New York, I was like, let me try this for a minute. And it's harder in New York. That's, I got the, uh, my bookie operation got shut down in three weeks. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Three mm. weeks, someone caught wind of the kind of action I was taking. My brother went to collect. It gotcha. was a little bit of a got you moment. Mm. Yeah. And I just ended it that day. Mm. I didn't even think twice. At the, at, at the peak, how much uh, at one time, what was the most money you'd got during that run? When I was 19, I left Boston about 280 in cash. <sighs> That's tough. Yeah. Off the street. <laughs> right, for yeah. real. Quarter That's a million. Brick. That's yeah. A whole brick. Yeah, for real. In a safe like this. Yeah. Like thinking I had a safe when really, like, the safe could just be picked up by anyone. I was right. an idiot. I had that shit in my closet. Everyone in school knew, but mm. it was reckless. That's tough. This weekend, one of the biggest fights of the year is going down on Showtime. The legendary Canelo Alvarez versus my Texas brother, Jamel Charlo. For the big fight, we're partnering with DraftKings, giving all new customers a can't-miss offer. Right now, new customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings app now. Use promo code SMOKE when you sign up. Stack, what's your prediction for the big fight? My heart's saying Charlo, but I know how experienced Canelo is. He's the face of boxing, and he's been in big fights before. Uh, I think it's going to go to a decision, and I think Canelo might pull it off. New customers, you heard Stack. Download the DraftKings app now. Use promo code SMOKE and make your picks. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers, use promo code SMOKE. Bet $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code SMOKE only at DraftKings. The crown is yours. With the busy fall season, you might be looking for some wholesome, convenient meals for your jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. Too busy with your end-of-the-summer goals to cook, but still want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store, the chopping, the preparing, and the cleanup too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Then get back to crushing your goals. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfections by chefs, and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to an upscale meal with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Try delicious, dietitian approved, calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving if you're looking for something calorie conscious. 
Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving if you're looking for more protein. With Factor, you can rest assured making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. Get Factor and enjoy eating without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door, ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash smoke50 and use the code smoke50 to get 50% off. That's code SMOKE50 at factormeals.com slash SMOKE50 to get 50% off. Uh, anyone along the way uh, mentor you or, or, or put their arm around you, or was it just trial and error, hard knocks? No, a lot of people have. I, I, I always say that, like, I never had a, a, a business mentor, so to speak, like somebody that um, was like, hey, young man, I, I see something in you. But what I did always get was special, special talent that gave me a shot. So Mark Ronson in 1999 in New York City would be jumping from DJing Biggie Smalls' birthday party to a Tommy Hilfiger fashion show and him and Q-Tip and this whole like celebrity DJ scene grew up, like blew up in New York at the time. And, you know, I started managing these guys. And when I was managing Mark, all of a sudden I was like, oh, you know, I got a little bit of confidence. Like that infused a little bit of confidence in me. Then when all, all of a sudden I was signed other artists and we had Amy Winehouse working in our studio and I was around just like such greatness. Like this woman was recording one of the most incredible albums of all time. And I found myself fitting in. The more and more I was around talent, I understood how to fit in. And I think a little bit of the like chaos that I grew up around allowed me yeah. to have this feeling of I could solve anything, I could fix anything. Anyone needing me, I'll do, I'll do it right away for mm -hmm. you. And that's how I was conditioned. I just felt like as a kid, if something was broken in my house, literally or figuratively, no matter what age I was at, I'll step up and do it. Yep. So that carried that over and, and it worked with talent. And then when I was able to meet Jay and, you know, and got the vote of confidence from him to work on Fade to Black and be a part of that, that was like, a new level of mentorship. But it wasn't like Jay was like, hey, yo, Rich, I want you to produce my film, bro, and I see something in you. It was just getting a little bit of a crack. And then that was all they really needed to do was give me that bit of confidence. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a similar upbringing just as far as chaos. And I, I, you know, I got to a point where I was comfortable within the chaos. You know, you mm -hmm. can still function, you can still move, because chaos fucks some people up. But being able to be comfortable and still at peace within the chaos is something special. Um, you just mentioned, Jay, how did the Rock Nation partnership come about? Well, after we did Fade to Black, I had like, you know... Well, hold on, let me rewind, not to cut you off. Talk to us about how the, the Fade to Black came and what you actually did on that project. Yeah, I, um, I met Jay's manager at the time, and I was um, consulting with this company, Radical Media, because I was doing music supervision for um, TV shows on ESPN and, and VH1, and there was a show, The Life, on ESPN. You guys remember that? Remember? Yeah. You Were you on it? No. We did it on Ed O'Bannon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And I put this theme song together between Farrell Monch and Styles P called The Life that J. Cole actually ended up, like, redoing a bit on his last album. Sorry, Cole, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and... Um, after that, like I started building this library of, of unsigned artists and unsigned producers to put on all these different um, TV shows. And I was kind of like in this little purgatory now. I was managing some people. I was doing some music supervision. And that was that like moment where sometimes I feel like in my career, I pedal as fast as I can. Then I got to chill and like let it glide and be able to just see, like see what I'm doing. Because I'm really aware of who I am and who I'm not. I never try to pretend I'm the biggest, baddest, most successful. I just know I'm uniquely me and I try to like follow that. So sometimes I just pause on it. And at that point, it was like, oh shit, Jay-Z's manager wants to come in and meet. And I was like, but if he comes in and meets with me, I don't know what to say yet. And I knew that. I was like, I'm not gonna be able to sell him. But this guy at Radical Media will, this guy that I have here that's running this company. And that was part of like the lessons that I always realized while I was growing is like, just being in the room at certain times is the win. Yes. You don't always have to run the room, man. You got to know where your mm -hmm. time is. And, and for me, I was like, now I have a part of bringing this film together. And I raised my hand. I said, I want to be a producer on it. And at that point, that meant like music clearances. If someone was wearing a Von Dutch hat in the film, because Jay was wearing I had to call Von Dutch and clear it. We had to get clearances from everyone that was backstage. Because when they shot it, they didn't know they were going to do the film. And then like... 
working with the editor, his first time ever editing a film, and he puts together like Fade to Black, and then watching Jay come in, no joke, and do the VO for the film in like one take, insane. Hmm. Just like see the film and just start spitting. And the VO is the story, it's like epic. And just playing that part in it, being able to be a producer on it, once again, no one was like, hey, yo, Rich, you are producing my film. I just saw the crack and I found my way in mm. and I did the, the, did the work, you know what I'm saying? And then from there, I always saw it as like these kind of like building blocks. And then when I had the opportunity to go over to Rock Nation, it, it was the right time. Like I had the foresight to know that even as an entrepreneur, I was going to need some institutional knowledge, like really be around people that were doing it. And and that was my journey. And I learned like endless, limitless what I learned from being there for nine years. So you started on the Rock Nation side, but then you helped Rock Nation Sports as well. Can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I started on the music side and I was managing, you know, like I said before, Meek, uh, Wale, uh, Mark Ronson. I was a uh, and &R. I hate, whenever I say this, I know that I had nothing to do with making this album, but I was listed as an AR and r on J. Cole's first album. I'm just going to continue to talk about J. Cole here, but um, I was doing dope shit. Like, I was around all of this, but it, it wasn't giving me that feeling that I had when I was, like, had my studio downtown on Mercer, and or I was a bookie, or I was managing DJs. I just didn't have that feeling anymore. And these guys knew that I was a sports fanatic and loved sports, and they always gave me an opportunity. They always gave me more space. So as soon as I said, like, yo, I want to be in sports, he was like, all right, yo, we start in a sports agency. And, you know, I guess sometimes that's the version of, like, mentorship. It's just a yeah. chance. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't need any guidance. I just needed a chance. So mm -hmm. as soon as that happened, I, I, I had to reluctantly just stop everything in music. I knew right then that these were two different worlds. And even though 10 years later, they're more First, a mesh than ever, yeah. and boardroom is really, in my opinion, like, a reflection of that, but I knew in order to go into the sports world, I couldn't now try to be who I wanted to be without locking all the way in and being on the ground and doing the work. Like literally, you saw me with Kevin everywhere he was yep. for the first six, seven years. Charity event, uh, a deal we're closing, anything he had to do, I had to do. That's how I looked at it. So when I went into sports, it was like just studying it as a kid, hearing the language, and, and honestly, being obsessed with the deals around sports, even as a, as a young person, I could speak that language. And then coupled with the back I had at Rock and their institutional knowledge, and then just seeing that the sports world was actually craving more and more of what was coming from music, not the old guard of how sports was being built around athletes, it was the right time. And it, and it worked. So, oh. Back to 35 Ventures. Uh, you invested in Postmates, Sea Greek, Therabody, just to name a few. If an entrepreneur was right here and asked you for some advice, what would you tell them? On investing? Um, I guess, first of all, like figure out why you're doing it. Um, and I continue to remind myself that too. My strategy early on was to learn, to meet incredible founders and to take some chances on some really innovative companies. And we were making smaller bets and that was my kind of education into the world. And my instincts and Kevin's instincts, I think, you know, benefited us, but it was really to get into the world. And that's why we spread out our investments and we made some reads early and we were, we were fortunate. As we started to get further, further into it, it started to be about like, what do we want to own? You know, cause that gets lost sometimes. There was a time six, seven years ago where everyone was just like, I want equity, bro. I'm only about equity. And it was like, well, what are you talking about? Like, you have to want equity in something you want to own, truly want to own. And I started reframing that. And that's why we started investing more and more into sports and into emerging sports leagues and into pickleball and women's soccer and women's volleyball, because it was like, that's what we want to own. Now, obviously, if an investment comes that's incredible, too good of an opportunity and everything checks out, still look at it like a sound investment. But I think I would tell an entrepreneur first to figure out what their reasoning for investing was. Like, are you just doing it to make money? Are you doing it to be safe with your money? Are you doing it to try to make a big hit? Or are you doing it because you want to build assets and this is like what your core build, your business is going to be? And I think it's important now, especially in this market, more than ever to know that. Five years ago, you probably could have cheated it. It's been like you had money, you got deal flow, you'll invest, you probably make some money back. But now everything's been equalized, you know, and you have to really look at 
real companies, real revenue, real brands. And it's no longer about these like insane valuations or companies that are never profitable, but tell you that they're going right. to be $20 billion. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you've got to reframe your mind. And I think for people like us, it's going to benefit us because it's back to like, have you done the work? Is the business working? Is it true? Is it making money? And that's how you got to look at companies now. Mm. You said something interesting when you first started talking, you said placing bets, because at the end of the day, that's what it really is, right? I mean, you have to be comfortable losing the money that you're putting forward. You have yeah. to be safe with that. But explain why you said bets, because that's what it is. Because at our level, right, like I'm not Andreessen Horowitz. Like, you know, that's the other thing is like the scale of investing. It'd be like me saying I hoop to the two of you. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I do invest, but I'm not making $50, $100 million investments. And I'm betting on founders. I'm betting on companies that sometimes I say, you know what? I think this company is going to make it, but I also see this company being really valuable and complementary to what I do. And I also see that founder as a founder is going to be successful in what they do no matter what. And it's going to be incredible to have them in my network again. Yeah. You know, like I said in the beginning, because having that network, man, is it's priceless. And I realized it during the pandemic, because one of the reasons why my, pan my business grew during the pandemic is because I could actually get people on the phone. Because there's a difference between showing up to every party and being able to take pictures with everyone and be able to dap everyone up. But when you have to set a time to get on a Zoom, Shit ain't easy. the relationship has to be real yeah. now. And that was from the work I put in. And that's not from like just the superficial shit. That's from really developing relationships. And I think for me, it's now like paying attention to every single thing that I do. And I'm like, all right, do I want to make a bet on this anymore? Or am I at the point in my career now where I have to start thinking about more like institutional things to set up for ourselves for the rest of our life? And for Kevin, you know, I really separated boardroom and 35 ventures. So I could say to Kevin, this is your family office, man. It's what you worked for. This is what you work for. You have a foundation. You have a standalone building called the Durant Center. We're building a Durant Athletic Center. You have a Team Durant facility. Your mother runs the Durant Family Foundation. You have a Nike lifetime deal. Like, Kevin is built an incredible portfolio and business for himself. And I take pride in it because his great grandkids are going to benefit mm -hmm. from this. But now boardroom is where I bet, right? Boardroom is where I'm still like, yo, I want to pivot a bit, or I want to do a party in Vegas, or I want to do an event. Uh, with CNBC in LA, like I'm doing in two weeks. And for me, Boardroom is now the brand that we're going to take chances with. And, you know, Pickleball, it's a chance, but I didn't separate it. I said, anything we do is going to fall into this bucket. And I think that's where I'm having more fun. And then on the more institutional side, it's really looking at investments that, you know, can withstand the test of time now. What's the most riskiest investment 35V has made? That paid, that, that paid off. That paid off? Um, that's a good one. Well, I would say early on, the first few investments in hindsight were all risky because I didn't know shit. Right. right. <laughs> like straight up didn't know anything. Um, but there's something refreshing about that. I actually like missed that feeling a bit. I remember sitting one of my first meals, Kevin and I went to um, Tosca in San Francisco. Remember that spot? Mm -hmm. And we were sitting with a famed... Uh, angel investor, Ron Conway, seed investor, became a billionaire. And, and like people have attributed their success to him over and over again. Facebook, Airbnb, he's behind everything. And he started asking me questions about deals. And like he said something very like trivial to start, like a Series A round. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I got to ask this guy what Series A means. Like, I honestly don't know. Like, or is he just going to laugh me off this table? And I was like, I got to keep it real. I've never done this before. I have no idea told me about Series A in rounds, Series B. And this is the same thing my basketball coach told me once when I was younger, which was like a major backhanded compliment. But he was like, every time you fuck up, you never do it again. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean, man? But it meant that like, you tell me something one time and I'm just not gonna forget it and I'm not gonna do the same thing again. So I just sat and consumed all this information. And I think it was like, Risky, but it was pure how we approached in the beginning. Because Kevin and I would have these founders come meet with us. I don't even know what we were asking. But we were asking these, like, personal questions and really getting to know them. And you realize sometimes, especially early on, and if you're a good read of people, and I think to your point before, if you grow up around some chaos at times, too, you're hyper aware. So you read people. And I'm always reading people. And I really feel like I can read people's body language better than some. And I would look at these founders and just be like, can I see this? 
woman or this man building what they say they're going to build? And do I get it? Like straight up, can I repeat it? Can I come see Matt and Stack and tell them what I just invested in? If I can't repeat it, I should not be investing in it. Right. And some of those early principles that weren't complicated actually really probably were really beneficial to the process without all the noise. Biggest return on investment you had to date? Um, if we're not being nosy. No, nah, it's cool. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, Postmates was great in the beginning. Of Coinbase course. was great in the beginning. Um, we have one now, even amidst this market, um, that we invested in, company Hugging Face, that I saw. What do they do? They're uh, AI technology. So it ended up really benefiting us as, um, you know, as they've grown into it. Because at the time, it was like loosely rooted in AI. Um, but there's been other good ones. There's some good ones on paper. There's some ones that if you asked me a year ago were through the moon and, you know, now they're back down, but I still believe in, in the business. But, you know, I think to be honest, the greatest investment we've made uh, has been in building boardroom ourselves. Whatever happens with it, it's been really amazing to, and I'm sure you guys, I mean, look what you guys have built, like from scratch, from mm -hmm. the two of you being like, let's do this show to people knowing it. That's the hardest thing yeah. in the world to do in business, to build a brand. So pe every, like people all over Vegas know what all the smoke is, independently of the two of you. That's incredible. And for me, it's like whatever happens now, I wanted to do this. I remember the day I thought about creating this. I still have miles and miles to go. But the fact that like it's resonating and it's mm -hmm. working, absolutely, that feels different than anything else I've ever done. Absolutely, that's dope. Another pillar of Thirty Five Ventures is the documentary side. Uh, Oscar award winning, uh, two distant strangers. We had Van Lathan and uh, Trayvon Free speak to it. Um, how did that partnership come about, and how was it winning your first Oscar? Well, it was incredible winning our first Oscar. Uh, unfortunately, for short form doc EPs don't get a trophy, but it's all good. Um, <laughs> it was cool to be associated with it. You know, it's funny because every film we've worked on, I've done 10 of these now, and I would never refer to myself as a filmmaker. From Fade to Black to KD's The Off Season on HBO, and we did a show, Cue Ball, that was on San Quentin Prison mm -hmm. when you yeah, were in dope. the Bay. Mm -hmm. But it was always just like a story we wanted to tell. So PG County obviously was yeah, a story yeah, we wanted to tell. This was sent to me, my, my friend Samir, during the pandemic. And he was like, just read the script and tell me what you think. And that was the first time we read a script and all we really needed from, or they needed from us was financing at first and like, you know, attaching our names and giving them their support and they did the rest. And, and we, in, in that sense, we read it right, right? Because the script was incredible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like with Swagger, similar, that was an idea Kevin and I had because you know, all Kevin talked about when I first met him was this rec center he grew up in. And it was amazing to me how formative that rec center had been in his life. So the idea came about, about like the rec center in some ways, or PG County being the backdrop to this like Friday nights like story about youth basketball and what went on. And Reggie, who's the director of Swagger, just knocked it out the box. But you know, that was a partnership with Imagine and Brian Grazer and Ron Howard, and it went to Apple. And again, like, I had the self-awareness to go, I can't make a big budget 10-episode series yet on Apple, but it's our idea. We're going to bring it to the right people. And then there's sometimes, like, with Point Gods, where I was like, shit, like, this is my baby. Like, mm -hmm. I, I speak this language. Yeah. And we rolled up our sleeves and got involved in that one. And I think it's fun to tell these stories. It's a great extension of our brand. I think it's still, like incredible when you see something up on the screen oh, or on nothing television like, like that, right? It's nothing like nothing it, like but it. it's got to be something that connects with us. Like right now I'm working on a doc on a, a, an artist from New York and it's like, you know, I would do this, I'd pay to do this. You know, it's like that type of stuff is just rewarding for me. So you did a, uh, two particular projects in the water and point guys that landed here at Showtime. Uh, what made those two so special? You've, you've been kind of touching on point guys throughout the documentary, or excuse me, about uh, throughout the interview. Talk to us about that and then In the Water. Well, In the Water was just like, every time I'd meet someone, KD would be like, yeah, he's from PG County. And I'd be like, him too? <laughs> he's from PG County. And it was like, holy shit. Like, there is insane amounts of talent that has come out of PG County. And then some young filmmaker from, uh, from PG sent me an email 
And it was a link, and he had put this sizzle together of an idea to do this project on, like, the greatness of PG County. And the one thing I don't ever do is make a firm decision on something for Kevin and I. You know, a lot of managers would be like, nah, he, I already know he ain't feeling that. But, like, Kevin is a different thinker. Yeah, so, like, <laughs> part of what our partnership is is sometimes he surprises the shit out of me. So I'm like, let me never take any of this for granted. I didn't think the sizzle was insane, but the passion there and the meaning was. Feel it. And I sent it to him. He's like, we got to do this film. And from then on, it was just like the more stories we heard, the more stories we heard, it was like it just proved our point that there was something in the water in PG County <laughs> that we had to do. And then New York, it's like, for me, man, Kareem Reed, Kenny Anderson, God Sham, God, Rod Strickland, like, that's Michael Jordan to me. You know what I'm saying? Those guys were God. And I always felt like point guards in New York City in the early 90s, in a lot of ways, were like the first reflection of hip-hop and sports, like this molding together. Yeah. It came out in the form of Skip to My Lou and God Sham, Stephon God. Marbury. Yeah, Stephon Marbury. Came, like, that to me, because they were superheroes, but in New York City, right. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it resonated. But when you looked at their careers, they they weren't all Hall of Famers, but the impact they had in New York, Huge. the Mecca, was off the charts. Yeah, yeah, to this day. To this day. How much basketball do you watch nowadays? A lot. A lot? Still? A lot, always, yeah, yeah always. Um, I keep up with everything. I mean, first of all, it's overwhelming the amount of information there is in general, but it's like I want to get more involved in the WNBA. I want to watch um, women's soccer because we invested in it. I want to watch MLS because we invested in it. I'm a Met fan. I'm a diehard Giant fan. Rick Pitino is coaching St. John's. I like to watch sports. I also have a family. I also socialize. <laughs> right. I also go out. I also work. So it's unbearable how much there is to watch. Basketball is one that I'll never cheat. I have to keep up. A, because it's like my partner is a savant. So if I don't know what I'm talking about, he may be like, bop, get yeah. out this mm -hmm. room, man. So I always can keep up. I love the Knicks and Nets. Like, I watch them. I'll always watch them. I always watch KD games. And then, like, there's just so much greatness in the league. You know, there's team. Like, I didn't want to miss Memphis this year. I like watching Orlando. Um, I'll always want to watch Braun and watch the Lakers play. So it's like, it's the only television that still has stakes, that still has some uncertainty, that still has like a narrative and, a, and something that's bigger than all of us. You know, mm -hmm. you can't pause it all. Mm -mm, it's just nice. happening in real time. So like, I was watching Wimbledon before I came here to yep. watch the Alcaraz match. Yep. Like, it's still the best morning. entertainment on TV is sports. Outside of KD, best three in the game right now. Best three players? Jokic. Of course. Um, You think about that. Giannis. Mm hmm Braun. Who you like watching the most besides KD? Book. Book. Um, you get to watch that every night now. Yeah. Um, I like watching Jokic. I like watching Denver. I mean, I think that was like a refreshing thing to see. Because mm -hmm. growing up, it always felt like teams had like major superstar at center of galaxy and then like everything working on all cylinders for that person and the whole system works and there's continuity and the team goes every year. And that might not work for every organization, but it was fun to watch that, like to see people enjoying the hell out of being the ninth man on that team and coming in the yeah. game. Um, but I actually really love watching, like, Orlando's been fun to watch because, like, I like to watch development of some of these guys, too. So, like, I liked watching Paolo's game early on and then, you know, midway through the season and then seeing how he would adjust towards the end of the season. So, you know, I, I watch whatever's on. What's next for Boardroom? Two questions. What's next for Boardroom and how is it working with Sabrina Inescu? Amazing. I mean, Sabrina, you know, she's, her agent, Duffy, is been incredible to me. So he really was like open. Not many people would have been open to what I was envisioning early, which was that I'm building this brand and this platform. I wanted to embody the business of sports and music and all these things that we're, that we're, we're compelled by. And there's deal flow and there's access and opportunity and storytelling. And I really want Sabrina to be a part of it, but I, I'm not getting in the way of what you guys do. I just want her to be a part of it. And it, it's worked out because, you know, she's been, um, She's given us ideas. She's heard ideas from us. She supported the brand. And just having her, you know, as somebody that's like part of the fam has been 
it's been powerful. And I think that's a big part of where we're going now is like Boardroom has the digital media platform. We have, you know, our newsletters and our pods and our shows, and we're doing more and more in the physical. Our conference with CNBC should be a hit. We got Travis Scott, KD speaking, Paolo, David Blitzer, a ton of people, Tamika. And I think also it's going to be time for us to start aligning ourselves with more talent and building out, you know, an element of Boardroom that's an advisory where we can work with more athletes and you know, and similar to what we were able to do with Sabrina, but a bit more formalized um, to have more in our in our camp. And, and I also think we can be a benefit to agents. Like, I don't see this as a competitive right. thing. I see that, you know, this, this vehicle we built and the access we have and the brand we built can only be a complement to other people's business. Who is rich outside of business? Um... Cool as a motherfucker. Cool yeah. as a motherfucker. Yeah. Could throw the could throw the football a little bit. Yeah, I could throw the football. Uh, I love the shit out my family. Like everyone says that, but I, you know, I, you know, I, I really, really, really try to form a, a perfect balance for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that I started doing this at like 16. Like I was in the clubs in New York at 16. I know I'm not the richest dude in the room. I know I'm not the most successful dude in the room. But I know that I have my spot. And I've been doing it for so long that I feel like I have a, a perspective and I feel like I'm moving in slower motion now. And I'm aware of what is happening and I know where I can impact. The game has so slowed down for you. The game has slowed down for <clears throat> me. So I go back home and get that balance for my family because it keeps me slowed down. And now for me, it's really just about like continuing to build and, and continuing to find things that, that inspire me. But like when I check out, I check out. I'm playing pickleball. Uh, I'm with friends. I'm social as shit. I like to be in the mix. At 46, I try to balance like being 46, but being in the mix. Because mm -hmm. the last thing I tell everybody that's my age is like, do not get out of touch. Don't try to act all like you mm -mm. bigger than social media. Mm -mm. You, you, it's bad for you. You have to stay connected or you'll get old. Yep. Right. And I'm not trying to get old. At yeah. all. I damn sure ain't. All I'm right. Not, I'm not forever. <sighs> we winding this down right now. Quick hitters. First thing to come to mind. Uh, let us know. Stuck on an island, three shows or movies in rotation. Succession, Casino, and Juice. Because I just oh. watched it the other day, and I'm hooked again. So speaking of Casino, I just played in the NBPA golf tournament on Monday, and it was at the golf course, the Las Vegas Country Club, and they still have the little plane inside the little thing, and I oh took a feel God, so dope. Because I was, it was weird because we were playing. I'm like, damn, this course is kind of seen. It didn't, it didn't show a ton on the movie, but I just kind of felt like the houses. And I looked, I was like, is that an airplane? I was like, oh, yeah, this is where they shot Casino. I'm like, what the That's fuck? That's where the feds ran out of yeah, gas. Yeah, remember? And they yeah. crashed in the thing and bounced. <laughs> Brush, it was hella cool. Yeah, if you ever decide to do a movie, Rich, with some gangster shit, I gotta have a role. <laughs> oh, uh, hell yeah. <laughs> played hoops. Who you compare your game to? Uh-oh. If if I was playing hoops? Yeah. Um, a shooter. Definitely a shooter. Uh, when I was younger, I definitely, like, tried to get a little bit of the, like, New York City point guard shit, so I'd make, like, a pointless no-look pass. But I always shot the ball a little better than New York City point guards. Um... Like, you'll understand this. I'm more of like a, a, a two, three from back in the day. Not, I, I, don't, I wouldn't have worked in positionless basketball. I would have had to play you when there your was position. like a real two or three. <laughs> were, were, yeah. were you nice like Willie Dersh? Oh. <laughs> you remember Willie Dersh? Yeah, I, I mean. Willie was smooth, bro. Left I, hand. Yeah, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I you could just shoot had, it, though. You had jumper. And I hit big shots. Okay. Hit big shots. Okay. So maybe this call you JJ Reddick. You may love the pressure. Yeah. Uh, top three business moguls you know outside of you and your team? That I know personally? Mm-hmm. Um, Lorreen Jobs. Incredible businesswoman, incredible philanthropist. Um, Jimmy Iovine. Monster. Love everything about that man. Um, and let me think. Uh, Diddy. Diddy, because I think that um, the one thing about being an entrepreneur that you have to be able to do more than anything is, is like wins and losses just keep going. And I've never seen any human being as relentless and keep going as him. Mm -hmm. I would put an asterisk now and add Michael Rubin just because it, it's like I was saying earlier about everyone being uniquely them. I've never, ever seen anyone like him. What he's built is is beyond inspiring and um and something i noticed at his party last week and my wife and i noticed it is a special quality is that 
he took time to really say hello to everybody at the it's party. Crazy. It's and I watched people. it because he knows me very well. He knows my wife a little bit. But I saw, you know, you always pay attention when you're with your girl out. You want to make sure he's, mm -hmm. she good, everyone good. And I saw him just like reach across the bar and make sure he made eye contact. And that's what works in business, right? right? So if you don't do that Personal when you're at your own yep. party or do that amongst mm -hmm. people, it will end up being a detriment in business. And mm. you could see why even as relentless as he is, he clearly has a level of empathy. And I think that's what's made him really special. Yep. If you had to rewatch one game in history, courtside, what would it be? What mm. game would it be? Oh, man. That would definitely be, well, one game courtside, because some of them I was courtside. Um, but it's a, Nick games. It would I probably knew he was be. Say that. It would probably be a. Um, well, now I'm thinking about all the ones that didn't go our way. I was about to say the Charles Smith game, but why That's would I? That's a whole wanted, bunch of games. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I would probably say Starks is dunk. Starks is dunk Ooh, on the, the Bulls. The left tough. over the yeah. Bulls. That Starks is dunk on the Bulls. If I was sitting yeah. right there on the floor, I probably would have lost my mind. By the way, when KD hit the shot where his toe was oh. over the line, I went out of body. Like it sucks that they that that for many reasons. But my reaction, I had to kind of like push to the side because we didn't win the game. But I went like mosh pit that was extra. I went shot. wild. Yeah. Yo, because that was the that was the finals. That was the championship. That was everything. Mm -hmm. one, one inch. Long toast. Five dinner guests, dead or alive. You plus five at the dinner table. Me plus five at the dinner table. You and KD plus five because I don't want him to take a, uh, an extra seat. He's well, he's him with and you. I would definitely yeah, have together. different five. No, but bro. I'm saying you two together and then you're five. Okay, us two together <clears throat> are five. Um, you're five. I'm just gonna freestyle clearly because um, I would say uh, Quincy Jones, uh, Muhammad Ali. Jimmy and Dre, and Serena. Nice. One guest you would like to see on our show, but but you have to help us get your answer on the show, the award-winning show. So, so, so someone in that Rolodex of yours. Yeah. That I have to help get on this show. Yeah, yeah. so award someone you would like to show. see, but someone you're cool with. Someone you could, you know, you said picking up the phone or getting on a Zoom. You know, that kind Jason. Of <laughs> Wash that down yeah. with our mezcal. Jay-Z, <laughs> excuse me. Wash that down with our mezcal. Someone else would have to make that call. For you. <laughs> <He> said, <laughs> yeah. That's a, one thing about Rich, that he's very self-aware. Yeah. He knows. <laughs> yeah. You know what you do good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may get him before me. Um, shit. Let me think about that. I mean, who have you not had on that you want? Why don't you give me a job? Give me someone. I'll go get it. I'm better that way. Hey, I love that. Okay, I'm gonna make. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a hit list of like three yeah. to five. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Give me three. I like I'll that. work for free. Ooh, ooh, I like said my one guy. name at this dinner that we didn't have. Serena. So we, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Wait, what's who we had? Serena. You're talking. Uh, Williams I'm inviting or... her to my dinner, not because I can get her. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this dinner, man. Get he wants to get couch. to know her a little bit, right? <laughs> well, Rich, man, we appreciate your time. I've always been a big fan of you. Uh, again, one of the real genuine people in this space, and that's hard to come by. I uh, wish you continued success with the venture, boardroom. We got to find something to do together. Yep, Before we get, get out of there, boardroom money. we got to shout out one of the best companies in the world. And my guy, Scott, with Legends. We got a little Legends All the Smoke gift bag for yes. you, my brother. And We're also legends, let them know what, we, what we're beveraging, Matt. Yeah, man. We, you've been drinking on our Mezcal. Coming out soon. Anilios. Yeah. Do we have a name for it yet? What, what did that yeah, mean? You the just that means rings in Spanish. Okay. You learn something new every day. Rings in Spanish. Championship rings in Spanish. Before the we Nilios. get out of here, we definitely want to shout Do out Excess Nightclub, rings. the Wynn Hotel. Thank you for hosting us. Again, shout out to Legends. Rich, Malibu. we appreciate your time. You can catch this on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform, Black Effects. We'll see y'all next week. For the first time ever, reigning undisputed kings fight on boxing's biggest stage. I'm the king. Mexican icon and pound for pound all time greats, Canelo Alvarez. King Canelo. Takes on the elite superstar set on making history, Jermel Charlo. The power is for real. Two kings, one throne, no mercy. Championship heart on display. Canelo versus Charlo for the undisputed world title. Saturday, September 30th, live on pay per view.